Hello students and welcome to the week three makeup lecture for Political Science 1513, American Federal Government. As you know, this lecture is basically just giving us an opportunity to briefly run through the portion of this week's PowerPoint that I was not able to cover in class because I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. this Thursday and Friday. So basically, I want to cover that last learning objective where I ask you to explain some of the strengths and weaknesses or pros and cons associated with our federalist system of governance in this country. And I'm going to begin by providing just a little bit of recap, because when I ask you to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of federalism, you need to be familiar with the alternatives to federalism, so you've got a basis for comparison. Towards that end, remember that federalism shares and divides lawmaking authority across different levels of government, but that there are two alternative approaches to governance that you need to be familiar with. So one approach is to use what we call the unitary system of governance. And in a unitary government system, basically all lawmaking authority is concentrated in the hands of the federal government. Modern examples of this include China and France today, and historical examples include the British Empire prior to our Declaration of Independence. So we lived under a unitary government before we broke off and became our own country. Once we broke off, once we declared independence, we fled to the opposite extreme with the Articles of Confederation that governed our country as a confederacy for the first eh, 10 or so years of the nation's history. So what is a confederacy? Well, if a unitary government concentrates all the lawmaking authority in the hands of the central or federal government, the confederal system is the opposite. It concentrates virtually all lawmaking authority in the hands of the individual state governments. And when you compare these two systems of government to one another, you're going to find that each of them also has its own set of strengths and weaknesses, as we discovered during the early stages of our nation's history. So we lived under unitary governance in the colonial era, and that was helpful in that it made it really easy for us to do things like, oh, I don't know, build an empire covering 25% of the world's land mass. Uh, unitary governments, by concentrating power into the hands of a single central government, are really good at identifying clearly articulated goals for the country or the empire as a whole, and then getting everybody to work together towards the fulfillment of those goals. So that's their primary strength. They are really good at organizing nationwide responses to problems and issues which are too big for any individual region, state, or subdivision within the country to handle on their own. Unitary governments also have the advantage of clearing up some confusion by creating clear standards that are enforced uniformly across the country as a whole. So a unitary government, for example, will have one currency, and that currency will have the same value regardless of where in the country you happen to be spending it. In a unitary country, you have a single citizenship. And you can contrast that with like the system that we have today where I am a citizen of the United States, yes, but I'm also a citizen of Oklahoma. And there are different standards of citizenship that I need to familiarize myself with in order to understand what that means. So the unitary system is simpler. It creates a little bit of consistency. It clears up confusion. And we don't necessarily get to enjoy that same degree of uniformity in either confederal or federal governments. An example of confusion that might emerge when you deviate from the unitary system of government actually comes when we start to talk about same-sex marriage. So, as you probably know, before the United States Supreme Court weighed in on the issue of same-sex marriage, we had a piece of federal legislation originally pushed into action by then-President Bill Clinton called DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and basically this devolved the issue to the state. In other words, before the Supreme Court weighed in, every state got to create its own laws pertaining to same-sex marriage and whether they would allow it. Some states said yes, some states said no, and this created confusing situations where, for example, California legalized gay marriage before Oklahoma. So there was an actual case that went to the Oklahoma Supreme Court where we had a lesbian couple in California and they got married. Then they moved to Oklahoma, and once they got here, 
they decided that they were not in love anymore and that they wanted a divorce. So they filed for divorce after having lived here for several years, and the courts had no idea how to handle that because at this time, Oklahoma didn't recognize same-sex marriage. In fact, our Constitution prohibited any government decision-makers in Oklahoma from acknowledging the validity of a same-sex marriage. And so these individuals were essentially in a situation where they didn't know if they could get a divorce and were perpetually stuck together or not. Turns out they got it to the Oklahoma State Supreme Court. They were allowed to dissolve their marriage. They were allowed to get a divorce. But just think about that. It's a routine divorce case that had to go to the Supreme Court, the highest judicial authority in our state, because our judges, our government decision makers, and our citizens were so confused by the complexity of the situation that nobody could figure out how to handle it. Okay, so that's the advantage to a unitary government. It's better at organizing to tackle big problems that are too large for any portion of the country to tackle on their own, and it provides some standards of uniformity. The confederal government does come with a certain degree of confusion, but it also has its advantages. So, for example, in a confederal government, what we're going to find is that the state and local governments are stronger, and that means that they are better equipped to deal with the local wants, needs, and interests of the local population. Every state in our country has its own economic wants and needs, and it deals with its own set of natural and artificial issues. So, for example, it is helpful that Oklahoma can have one disaster preparedness plan where we build tornado shelters, while Florida can have a completely unconnected natural disaster plan addressing hurricanes and tsunamis. We in Oklahoma don't have to deal with hurricanes and tsunamis, so we don't want our disaster preparedness resources being wasted on disaster preparedness programs geared towards protecting us from tsunamis and hurricanes. And certain parts of our country are going to have earthquakes, whereas others aren't. The same thing's going to apply here. So confederal governments help to create specialized policies by providing local discretion, and that's an advantage. What we're going to find is that confederal governments are also more responsive to changes in public will and to local expectations because they're easier to control in that by devolving power, they make the separate governments people are dealing with much smaller and more manageable. So one way that you might control the decisions that your government is making would be to simply ensure that your government decision makers, your legislators, were in communication with you, that you had conveyed to them exactly what you want. And it's a lot easier for you to convey your thoughts, your wants, your needs, your expectations with a state or local representative than with a federal or national representative located all the way across the country in Washington, D.C., if you wanted to speak to the senator for this district in the Oklahoma State Senate, well, that's David Bullard. He comes on campus all the time. Whereas it's a lot less likely that you'll be able to secure a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Senator Lankford or Senator Inhofe all the way over in Washington, D.C. So confederal governments give us the advantage of local discretion, and they are easier to control in that the governments are smaller and less powerful. Therefore, they are more manageable but they come with a consequence of creating greater confusion and are not particularly well equipped to address national issues. Federalism, the argument goes, by compromising between these two extremes helps us to grab the best of both worlds. Instead of giving all power to the unitary federal central government or to all of the individual state governments, we're going to share and divide across the two so that we can organize for national goals and problems when we need to, but we also have the freedom to tailor local wants, needs, and expectations with local policies. So we are to some extent going to get the best of both worlds. And what that means is that federalism is uniquely well suited for the governance of very large and diverse countries such as our own. We are not the only federal country in the world. Canada, that's a federal country. Mexico, Germany, and India, these are all federal countries just like ours. And what you're going to notice about them is that they are all also very large countries. They're very diverse. 
The reason that federalism is so well suited to large, diverse countries is that the dev the, dev the devolution of certain powers to local state representatives allows us to cater to wants and needs which are particular to portions of the country and might therefore be ignored if we had to run the entire nation as a single unit. But at the same time, by creating a relatively powerful federal government, we are able to organize these disparate interests into a concentrated effort when the need arises. Oklahoma can handle its tornado problem, Florida can handle its hurricane problem, but the country as a whole can handle issues like climate change, war, or foreign diplomacy. So federalism has the advantage of allowing both national unity and locally specialized policy outputs, which address our particular wants, needs, and interests, which are more geographically specific. Federalism also has the advantage of promoting creativity and innovation in policymaking through competition among the states. And to understand this, there are two terms that I want you to be familiar with. The first is what we call the diffusion of innovation theory. And your textbook elaborates on this concept, but the diffusion of innovation is basically this idea that many heads are better than one. So if you have a whole bunch of different states and they're all dealing with similar issues, each state can come up with its own approach to solving that issue. And then we can learn from one another so that we can begin to emulate each other's successes while avoiding each other's failures. In other words, if you come up with 20 separate solutions to the same problem, each solution being implemented by a different state, you've got more creative solutions to look at, think about, and learn from. And that creates more innovation because certain policies are going to work and we might not have thought of those policies if only one body of laws was being created by one group of people and applied universally. So states can learn from each other, and that's the key characteristic of diffusion of innovation. But we also have this concept of states operating as what we call laboratories of democracy. And what that means is that states allow us to test out big changes to policy, whether those be environmental or economic or social or something else, at a relatively low level before we implement them nationwide. Okay, so there are lots of ideas that we might want to try because innovation is good. Coming up with creative solutions to old problems is probably a desirable thing, but most of our new ideas are going to fall flat on their face. They're just not going to work because that's how the world is. There are a lot of ways to get something wrong, not all that many ways to get it right. And if you implement a policy, which sounds great in theory or on paper, but ultimately fails in practice, at the national level, that's going to do a lot of damage. If we've got a new economic system that we think will work and we implement it for the entire country and it fails, well, we just collapse the whole country's economy and who's going to bail us out? But if we tried, if we tested that very same approach at the state level, then we would discover that it would work and that would suck for the state. If we implemented it in Oklahoma, our economy would collapse. But Oklahoma's economy is a lot easier to rebuild and repair than the United States economy because it's smaller, A, and B, if Oklahoma's economy collapses, well, we've always got our big brother in Washington, D.C. who can come and help us recover. If the economy of the entire country collapses, who are we going to turn to? The U.N.'s not going to have our back. So states operate as laboratories of democracy and if they give us a way to test out new ideas in microcosm on a small level before we risk implementing them nationwide finally it is worth noting that another advantage to federalism is that historically in our country it's provided a training ground for national leaders so Donald Trump throws a monkey wrench in this because he went from never having held public office to becoming the president of the United States, and that's relatively rare. A better example of how federalism provides training grounds for our leaders comes with basically any other president, but we'll focus on Barack Obama. Barack Obama, the president before Donald Trump, began his career as a politician at the local level as a community organizer. And then he got elected to serve in the city. And then he went from the city level to the state level. He went from the state level to the Senate. And then he became the president of the United States. So 
First, what we're going to find is that he governs a small community and he learns a little bit about leadership and politics. Then he governs a slightly larger community, a city. Then he goes to the state and then he goes to the federal government and eventually he becomes the president. And what we're going to find is that because of this, by the time that Barack Obama became the president, he was a lot more polished than he might otherwise have been. Donald Trump is a good contrast because like him or hate him, I'm not going to tell you how to feel. That's not what this class is for, and I won't put my own opinions in. But I think that whether you're conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, we can all agree that Donald Trump was not as polished in his public presentation when he started as president as was Barack Obama. Now, whether that's good or bad is, again, for you to decide. But historically, what we found is that leaders can develop their leadership skills by starting at the small, local level and working their way up. So those are some of the advantages to federalism, but there are also some disadvantages. And the most notable of these disadvantages is the same type of problem we run into with confederacies, just not to the same extent. We get confusion. Okay, so again, think about the issue of gay marriage. California might legalize same-sex marriage. A same-sex couple might therefore legally get married in California and then move to Oklahoma where it's still prohibited. Can they get divorced? I don't know because we've got conflicting laws. We don't have that national uniformity that we might if everything were governed at the national level. This creates confusion. That confusion in turn makes it really, really difficult for us to resolve small problems. What if you go and legally buy marijuana in Colorado or here in Oklahoma and then head back home to your house in Texas? Are you going to get arrested? Well, the answer is yes, but you might not realize that because you might be under the impression, well, it was legalized in Colorado. But hang on a second. It's also still in violation of federal law. So think about everything we talked about in class. Remember that there are opportunities for conflicting policies when different levels of government are creating their own bodies of law and when these bodies of law sometimes overlap and apply to the same people. And when that confusion emerges, it becomes an issue for some people. So one argument against federalism is that by creating a whole bunch of distinct bodies of law, it makes what is and is not permissible in our society less clear to the people who have to navigate these legal systems. Okay, so that's the first major problem with the system of federalism that opponents of our form of government have put forward. They've also argued that the states might become a problem if they interfere with national policies. And one of the examples that a lot of these individuals who criticize our constitutional system of federalism point out is with the Affordable Care Act. So I'm not going to tell you whether the Affordable Care Act is good or bad. Again, I'll let you make up your mind, but this is what you might know as Obamacare. It was sweeping health care reform that got passed into law under the presidency of Barack Obama. Now, proponents of the Affordable Care Act have argued that it's in the best interest of our country as a whole. But at the state and local level, a lot of local populations have been very strongly opposed to it. So while at the time of its passage, there was nationwide a fairly solid support base for the Affordable Care Act, there was very substantial resistance to this particular piece of legislation in Oklahoma because we Oklahomans had, as a whole, decided that it was not in our best interest. Maybe it was in the best interest of the country as a whole. I don't know. But for the sake of argument, let's say, yeah, sure, it's in the best interest of Oklahoma as a whole. Fine. But if you're the governor of Oklahoma, then you're not necessarily going to worry about what's in the best interest of the country as a whole. You're going to worry about what's in the best interest of Oklahoma because Oklahomans are the ones who will decide whether you get reelected or not. So even if a policy is in the best interest of the country as a whole, you have an incentive to interfere with that policy. And therefore, again, what we're going to find is that states may become an impediment to policies that overall we would benefit from. Whether or not that's a bad thing, I'll let you decide. But again, it is a criticism that some people have articulated. Another concern is that, again, when you diffuse responsibility across multiple states, when multiple different states have the power to establish legal standards, that's going to create some inconsistencies, and that might create confusion for, say, an employer who doesn't know whether or not a student from Texas has to learn algebra or how a college degree granted in Oklahoma compares to one granted in New York. 
national standards are useful for helping clarify what's to expect and we don't really have very many of those in a federal system such as our own the last major attack on federalism is this idea that it creates a race to the bottom now if you remember from the previous slide we talked about how federalism can promote improvement through policy innovation and competition and that's true Oklahoma will, for example, compete with Texas. We want people to come from Texas to live in Oklahoma so that they will spend money here and we can use that money to do things like build our roads and grow our economy. To ensure people are coming here from Texas, we try to compete to keep our cost of living down. But the race to the bottom emerges when we try to attract business and new citizens by driving down our taxes. We race to have our taxes at the lowest level. And to some extent, that might be good, especially if you're a conservative-minded individual. But remember that those taxes are also going to be utilized to pay for certain public services like the roads and education. And so when you lower the taxes, you, it is argued, are not only reducing how much money you take from your citizens, you're reducing how well you can serve the needs of those citizens as a whole. So this is the race to the bottom in that we are lowering the amount of money we spend on education and infrastructure and other desirable public goods in order to attract new citizens and businesses by lowering our taxes. So those are the big arguments for and against federalism. If this was a bit quick for you, I apologize. Please feel free to rewind, rewatch, and to take notes. But I wish you the best of luck on your assessment for this week, and I will see you when I get back from Washington, D.C. Bye.